in graduate school of theology, sorry. Um, in my mind, he's still at Harding. Uh, Keith was here in 2011, I think. Uh, not just for the summer, but for a six-month stay with his family, and we're um, plus his wife Nana here, and they have three kids who are staying in a uh, ant-filled flex apartment with a nice view. Uh, Paul and Isaac and Rachel. It's been lovely having them on campus. Uh, in 2011, they were here for a whole six months. It was a real blessing to have them around, and and Keith would, played a, a big part in helping plan and organize the uh, the Arminians conference that we had. And then uh, Keith and I and another colleague uh, uh, wrote a book that was published last year, or edited a book that was published last year with Abingdon that grew out of that. So it's been a, been a wonderful um, collegiality and friendship that we've developed over the last few years, and it's been really um, a real blessing to have Keith and his family back this summer. Um, Keith is an Arminius scholar, but uh, is, has moved on to some other projects, and we're going to hear about those right now. Okay. Uh, yes, give, give Keith a warm up. Thank you all. Um, thanks to uh, the West Wing Center, to Mark, and to Beth for uh, your hospitality, and to all of you for your presence today. I haven't, uh, sadly, haven't been to the, the previous um, presentations here. So I heard one was a little on the informal side, one was more on the formal side. I don't know what you're expecting. I'll try to balance uh, the two here. Good wrestling. What do I? Yeah, that's right. What do I have? Thirty minutes here. As long as you want. Okay. So I'll try to watch the clock. Uh, you can help me uh, if I go too far over. Um, one thing uh, I want to do as I begin is just tell you a little bit about that uh, the project, the main project that I'm working on. That that started a while back. I've continued it here. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to finish it here. And uh, it always goes much more slowly uh, than I think it's going to. Um, the outdoors here is very distracting. I don't know if you'll notice that uh, or not, but I haven't been able to get uh, some work done and I'm grateful for that. Uh, so some of it I, I put, I don't know if you bothered to read the um, little abstract that came out in the email, but it's basically a history of biblical interpretation that I'm working on. So uh, one thing I said on that is it, I have at least these three uh, aims in the book. Um, there may be more, uh, but one is I want to uh, describe the primary features, characteristics, goals of pre-modern biblical interpretation versus those of modern biblical interpretation. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, two, I want to uh, summarize kind of how the shift occurred between pre-modern and modern uh, ways of interpreting the Bible. And then three, um, offer reflections on how, kind of how do we deal with this in uh, our own time and place where uh, we can go back and see how people interpreted the Bible in the early and medieval church, um, but we also can't ignore the advances of uh, modern uh, interpretive methods. So what do we do with this? How can we kind of combine the best of the two? So there, there's a descriptive aspect and historical aspect of the book, but also there's I might say prescription and evaluation, and kind of I have an opinion about this uh, along the way. So a couple of uh, preliminary marks, just uh, remarks on the history of biblical interpretation. <coughs> First of all, uh, there are two things in that that often uh, bore students. One is history, and one is interpretation. Um, but the history of interpretation is actually a very important. Uh, discipline, I think, and an important question. It's questions like, in this case, how has the church viewed the Bible in the past? How have the perspectives of the past influenced then the way we read the Bible and what we bring to the biblical text? Um, even if we think we're reading without any bias and without a tradition, um, even to say that is part of a tradition and a bias. Uh, 
Um, so how have those perspectives influenced us? And then again, as I said, given all that we can learn from the history, how do we, as the uh, New Testament says, rightly handle the word of truth? Um, how, what is the proper way for us to use the Bible? History then provides perspective, just in general. Church history provides perspective on our present um, situation and our, and our own theology. The history of biblical inter interpretation, likewise, provides perspective on how we can interpret the Bible. Um, the early church scholar Robert Ferguson calls this historical foreground. If you're familiar with any kind of you know, modern commentaries, we talk about when you want to understand the biblical book, go to the historical background. Find out what was going on in uh, Paul's life when he um, was writing to the Corinthians. Find out what was going on in Corinth. What was the situation that he's addressing there? Historical background certainly helps us understand the book. Historical foreground means how is this book received? Um, in the first century, first by those Corinthians, let's say, and then by the others who not only copied, but distributed, read, preached from, and applied this book. Um, similar to what Gadamer calls Wirkungsgeschichte, the history of the effects of the text. Um, the reception history is what we're talking about here. What effects has the text had on subsequent generations? Because Christian history is chock full of people who have labored very hard to understand the text of Scripture. How did they interpret the text? How did they interpret the hard texts? What do they consider to be the hard texts? All these kinds of questions go into the history of biblical interpretation. So I take for granted that one cannot plunge the depths of God's Word in a solitary kind of situation. One cannot plunge the depths of doctrine without discussing it in community. The point here is that the community of interpretation extends beyond the people we may come in contact with on a daily basis. It extends beyond us. It extends to people who are not us and who are not like us. And the most easily marginalized people are those who are dead and do not happen to still be walking around and writing. So, it's the believers throughout history who also make up an important part of this interpretive faith community. Again, how did they interpret and apply scripture? Um, so, there's a caution here as well. It's not just um, all positive things we can learn. There are uh, negative things we learn, perhaps, as we look and see why we interpret the Bible the way we do. We may see that we have mistaken interpretations and find out we need to broaden our perspective. All of this, I think, can turn into a positive point, and that is we should have interpretive humility when it comes to interpreting the Bible. When we see not only our own, uh, perhaps, mistakes, but also mistakes in the past of brilliant people who had blind spots. I see uh, my project here also as an aid to what's called race for small. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, it's um, especially mid-20th century Roman Catholic theology made a real push to return to the sources. And what they mean by that is mainly the early church sources. Um, and they did this in theology in general. And then late 20th century up till now, still going on, Protestants and evangelicals have kind of caught on to this resource small movement. Um, realizing that, oh, there were smart people before the Enlightenment also. Maybe we can learn from them uh, as well. So, in addition to kind of general theological documents um, now being read and distributed, I think used much more uh, in, among scholars, we see an increase in an in interest in biblical interpretation in the early church. For example, some of you may be familiar with a, a multi-volume series called Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. We were talking about it uh, yesterday. Um, this is um, like a commentary, goes through the Bible, but instead of offering the comments of a living modern scholar, they uh, collect the remarks of early church writers 
on these particular biblical texts that it's going through. Um, it's a very popular series, by the way. Uh, one of the few that I have found doubled in the collection of the Ryan Library and in the Wesleyan Center collection upstairs. But what is a modern biblical interpreter or a student or a preacher supposed to do with all of these comments and remarks from the early church? Which in some ways, as again we're getting to, are very different from what you would find in a modern commentary. As a colleague of mine says, I'm kind of quoting here, I'm a big enthusiast for patristic exegesis in theory, and I want to find their exegesis illuminating. But when I turn to actual examples of patristic interpretation, um, basically the point is, I don't know what to do with some of their allegorical interpretations. So books like the Ancient Christian Commentary uh, series make the sources available, but don't go very far in kind of helping a reader today do something positive with what's there in that text. And it can't do that. I'm not criticizing uh, that series. Uh, each volume would be ten volumes if they went through and kind of said, here's exactly how you ought to preach this today and what you should do with this. But really, when you open up those commentaries, you get some um, things that most people would consider to be now off the wall. So in some ways my book is, I would say, an exercise in retrieval theology. The point here is not simply replicating or repristinating older theology or older biblical interpretation, but um, taking the best of the past, in this case the best of the past biblical interpretation, and allowing it to speak to us today allowing it to maybe um, have a, as I said, be a conversation partner at the table today. Um, so I see it as a critical appreciation for both pre-modern and modern types of exegesis. All right. Um, here's the most dangerous part of the presentation, because I'm going to ask for audience participation. All right. Um, I know. <laughs> We'll see. Okay. Um, I mean, I have things I can just continue reading if this doesn't work out. But I've, I've mentioned a couple of times the difference, the differences between pre-modern exegesis and modern. Um, and I know we have probably some theologians in here who, when I say that, that means something to you. We may have others who may have a vague idea of what it is. I've talked to multiple uh, lay people about this project and said, talked about the differences in their have never heard of that before, so we may have some of uh, that in here as well, that's fine. Um, but what are some of those, let's say, main differences, um, if I can give a more or less arbitrary um, date, up to 1500 we can call pre-modern, and then after, oh, 1800. That just allows for, there was a long period of transition here, okay? But in most cases we can call before 1500. Pre-modern interpreters here, after 1800, you're going to get mostly the same thing up to in the last few decades. And in many places, even today, the same kind of thing when we talk about modern historical interpretation or exegesis of scripture. So I'm throwing it out there. What are some of the uh, features, let's say, or characteristics, or even just assumptions about the Bible that would affect the interpretation for either one of these. And we'll just make a running list here. I mean, I have many things in mind, but I'm wondering also what you think about it when you hear that. Does it mean anything to you? you what do you expect to find? You mentioned allegorical earlier. So okay. The allegorical. And that goes on which side here? Pre modern. That's and right. We got prioritized. So allegorical interpretations, right? The text says this, but it means something else. There's another thing kind of cooking below the surface there. You also already mentioned um, the uh, some of the techniques and tools that are used in the modern era, modern era. So I'm going to the right of the line. Okay. Uh, such as looking at the historical background and and the social context and all that kind of thing. So historical critical methods. Um, Trying to uh, have a, a better understanding of what the uh, the text is saying within the context of of its writing. Okay. 
maybe that sums up both everything. <coughs> Which would be completely uh, missing from pre-modern. We, we wouldn't have a historical context. Okay, so There's less any... emphasis on or not. historical contexts. <coughs> okay. I'd say not. All right. Um, I'll leave it. little in there just in case. Uh, not a lot of interest. Little. In. Just not. A, it's not a concern. Right. What else? Would the historical contextualization include cultural? Yes, and it? yeah, all the things I think that uh, Mark mentioned, social as well. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, You have a shift in religious authority, uh, the rise of denominations, okay. lots of little popes all over as opposed to centralized. Okay, so you've uh, yeah, mentioned here, I think, it's got a more on that. centralized yeah, um, teaching in the church, magisterium, and then decentralized authority here. Okay. But yeah, every interpreter of the Bible is a little pope. This is all. This is all the Western Church, right? Uh, most, especially they on this one, yeah. But uh, that's mainly what we're talking about here. Yeah. In the in the Eastern Church, they didn't really have a Renaissance and Reformation as such, which is, as you probably can guess, what this so, little line represents here. So they're still in pre-modern. In, in some ways. Uh, yeah, when it comes to biblical interpretation. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe this is enough kind of to um, another, get, a, another, get a big picture here, some of the differences. Yeah. Another on the left uh -huh. would be uh, uh, spiritual slash mystical interpretations. Okay. So you would have a, you would, you would go from allegory to what's the mystical meaning. Okay. And you don't have that much in West. So on the right side, would uh, that be hmm, empirical methodologies, uh, something that is... Uh, That's kind of opposed to this, your... Application. Did you say empirical? Yeah, sort of more of an objective. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, may I put words in maybe yeah, your please. mouth here and say... Um, a real focus on authorial intent mm -hmm. as well. Just uh, maybe that's somewhat what you're getting at. Maybe that's narrower than what you were saying. I don't know. But the point here is um, we reject the spiritual senses because that's not what the human author at the time, it's not what Paul or whoever we're talking about had in mind is this spiritual or mystical extrapolation of the text. What did the human author have in mind? That's the meaning of the text. So it's objective. We can kind of study it scientifically, empirically. I don't know if that's exactly what you're getting at, but that's... Okay? Okay. A couple more here? Go ahead, Go ahead ma'am. Well, it's just that the stuff on the... That's the red. Um, all underneath it all is really the question of how much is true. Okay. Um, as opposed to its historic, it's situated, it's because of the culture, it's... So to me, there's a whole... I don't know if that's... You find any of that pre-1500, but it sure looks like it's a hidden part of what comes after. Okay. Objective. Trying to figure out how objective to truth, right? objective truth exactly, okay. and I'm not sure that's even a question that's getting posed. Right. So maybe different epistemological uh, approaches to what, what truth is, or, or even definitions of well, truth, and how it can come out of scripture. And so I, I was going to um, to reflect on this in, in a slightly different way, but I think it fits nicely with what Hadley has said. You have you have new kinds of challenges being brought to scripture that, that would have um, not been in, so, so Darwinism, science, for instance, in the modern era, create the kind of challenge because it suddenly seems, I mean, not that the, this is the first time ever, um, 
but the the, the um, there are there are senses in which scripture doesn't seem to jive with contemporary science, and so what do we do with that? And 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 there's also the other thing I was going to notice: the growing um, a, a growing uh, sense that these texts didn't just kind of drop down from the sky it, as whole, you know. So a lot of the uh, the historical contextualization begins to pick apart the texts by almost dissect them. So we've got Genesis and Exodus now being shown to be have various different authors, and and um, you know the, the, the documentary hypotheses, right? So um, in in a way, the text yeah. becomes something that is, um, and maybe this gets back to the spirit, rather than something that's being solely read with uh, with the intent to ask what is God saying to us. It's now being read in a, in a much more kind of scientific way, right? So it's a text that we dissect rather than a text we go to for uh, go to just for, for uh, nutrition or spiritual nutrition, right? Okay. Nourishment. Yeah. Sure. So definitely, um, it's a um, an object to be studied scientifically or in a scholarly kind of way. Um, where over here, it's the, the context, if I may say, is more liturgical. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, good. The audience participation thing went well. Okay. Um, oh, we want a uh, couple more comments then. Go ahead. I like to pose the word skepticism then. Yeah. For well, which one? The modern movement. Okay. Or the pre modern movement, it would be more of a bad faith value kind of like taking it in. Okay. I think that's what happened. Um, and, and yeah. yeah. And, and in what ways take what at face value or be skeptical about what? Basically sort of like this is what is taught and that's all it is, not actually getting into it because in the early days of the church, during the dark ages and stuff, the pope or the preacher would stand at the pulpit and be the only one to read the Bible. It wasn't until the printing press that people started being able to actually read the Bible for themselves. Okay. So. Good. Yeah. So definitely a skepticism and kind of enlightenment doubt here uh, comes into play. Hermeneutical Taking it, yeah, taking the text more in, the, in its history and what it says more at face value uh, before the modern era. Certainly true. All right, if uh, I may move on then, um, and just we'll count the audience participation as a success uh, <laughs> there. So thank you for helping with that. Well, the question is, do you think it was a success based on what you got up there? I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, it's a success because I'm hearing what people think about it too. So, um, but the by a, I mean, there are, there are things I would, of course, Nuance, and that's why you buy the book if it ever gets finished. Um, it, that I nuance, I would nuance throughout, of course. But part of it is, yeah, what do we think um, of allegory? And what do we think of some of these things? Um, but we have certainly received, especially this end of this, when we uh, usually approach the Bible, especially in a university kind of setting. There, I just going to say, there is a missing piece on the right that I think is really critical, because those are mostly you know, modern, higher criticism, liberal mm -hmm. interpretations of the modern world. But the evangelical views are also modern. Mm -hmm. The concern for inerrancy, the concern for infallibility, right. literal sense of the text, <clears throat> all that's a modern uh, modern enterprise that yeah. wasn't envisioned by the ancients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it certainly comes out in the fact that both it's a good observation that both, quote, liberals and, quote, conservatives um, in the last 200 years or so accept this method. Um, they may call it different things, but they accept this over against this over here. So you dig in the text for the literal interpretation, and as most higher critics, classic Protestant liberal scholars come out and say, well, taken literally, that text is nonsense. The, or the evangelicals and others say, taken literally, we can harmonize it, we can uh, just say the Bible says it, I believe it, 
that settles it, those kinds of things. Um, but both agree in rejecting, they both agree that allegory is the boogie. In that uh, way of thinking about it. True. Um, let me give an example as uh, time is slipping up here on me. Um, of pre-modern exegesis. I have kind of an outlandish example, uh, what many would see as far-fetched, but I think I'm gonna go with the more well-known example instead, and this is um, one that we read in Augustine. Um, Augustine is, um, as you may know, the most influential theologian in the history of the church, especially in the West, uh, one of the most prolific writers in church history, and as the scholar Gerald Bonner says, uh, the influence of Augustine on the later biblical exegesis of the Latin Middle Ages was enormous. So here's something I've kind of been working on in my three weeks so far here. Um, Augustine's influence on medieval exegesis has not always been seen as a salutary influence, especially by people on the right side of this uh, column here. So an example I give here is F.W. Farrar. This is late 19th century history of biblical interpretation. Um, he's no fan of pre-modern exegesis anyway, and he begins his discussion of Augustine's biblical interpretation by claiming that nothing indeed can be theoretically better than some of the rules which he lays down. Um, Farrar's criticism is that Augustine lays down good rules but fails to follow them himself. Quote, in the writings of St. Augustine, we see the constant flashes of genius and the rich results of insight and experience, which have given them their power over the minds of many generations. But these merits cannot save his exegetic writings from the charge of being radically unsound. Farrar excuses earlier Christian exegesis in the days of Justin Martyr and Origen because, um, he says, those uh, folks had been driven to allegory by an imperious necessity. In the days of Augustine, though, Farrar says, the allegorical method, quote, had degenerated into an artistic method of displaying ingenuity and supporting ecclesiasticism. So, Augustine becomes the epitome of allegorical excess that we see kind of the worst, the harbinger of the worst of medieval biblical interpretation. So, as an introductory glimpse of Augustine's style, uh, let me take a sample from his book, Questions on the Gospels. In this, he interprets the parable of the Good Samaritan. So, probably the most one of the most famous parables. Think about the story. I'm not going to read it to you from Luke 10, but you know the story. Think of how you interpret it, what it's saying, what the message is, if you were preaching from this text. Okay. And now listen to Augustine. Some of this is he's quoting from Luke 10, verse 30. But then you'll hear the, the interpretation. Uh, I apologize in advance for the long quotation here. Augustine. A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Luke 10, 30. He is understood to be Adam himself, representing the human race. Jerusalem is that city of peace from whose blessedness he fell. Jericho is translated as moon and signifies our mortality because it begins, increases, grows old, and sets. The phases of the moon, the humans. The robbers are the devil and his angels who stripped him of immortality and having beat with blows by persuading him to sinfulness left him half alive. Well, half alive is a quote from Luke 10. Because the man was alive in the part by which he could understand and know God, but he was dead in the part in which he was wasting away and weighed down by sins. And for this reason he is said to be half alive. But the priests and the Levite who saw him and passed by signify the priesthood and ministry of the Old Testament, which could not be of benefit toward salvation. Samaritan is translated as guardian. And for this reason the Lord himself is signified by this name. Did you know the Samaritan was promised for this? <laughs> the binding of the wounds is the holding of sins in check. The oil is the consolation of good hope. He poured oil and wine on him. It's the consolation of good hope because of the forgiveness given for the reconciliation of peace. The wine is an exhortation to work with fervent spirit. His beast of burden is the flesh in which he deigned to come to us. 
to be placed on the beast of burden is to believe in Christ's incarnation. The stable or the inn where the Samaritan took the injured man is the church where travelers are refreshed from the journey as they return to the eternal fatherland. The following day is after the resurrection of the Lord. The two coins are the two co that he gave for his care are the two commandments of love that the apostles received through the Holy Spirit in order to bring the gospel to others. Or they are the promise of the present and future life. The innkeeper then is the apostle Paul. <laughs> I love that one. Ellipses here, there. <laughs> okay? With these words, Augustine offers his interpretation of the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. And with these words, the worst fears of those who disparage allegory have been realized. <laughs> C.H. Dodd began his book, The Parables of the Kingdom, in 1935 by quoting the same passage. And then he notes that, quote, to the ordinary person of intelligence, this mystification must appear quite perverse. Mm -hmm. After the publication of Dodd's study of the parables, this example of Augustinian interpretation became rather notorious in some well-known exegetical handbooks. Robert Stein, now these are evangelicals I'm quoting here, just to the point earlier. Robert Stein refers to Augustine's reading as an instance of eisegesis, that is a reading into the text, that should be rejected, for it makes the parable say something other than what Jesus and the Gospel writers intended. G.B. Care calls it a farrago that bears no relationship to the real meaning of the parable. Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart feature it as an example of how not to interpret a parable asserting that, quote, it is not what Jesus intended. So, Augustine's interpretation of this parable has apparently become a locus classicus to illustrate how exegesis is not to be done. So, I ask what exactly is motivating Augustine's interpretation of this passage, or the exegetical principles that he intends to follow here. Uh, is there something we're missing, I guess is what I want to add. Is there some way to rescue this interpretation that we can even give it the time of day or a seat at the table? Um, to identify the Samaritan as Christ, just to, to give one more point about how ridiculous this sounds. Um, rather than simply identifying him as any good neighbor, which I think is how most of us would hear this parable, goes against what every modern churchgoer knows. Furthermore, to take the parable as a complex allegory, rather than as just a simple story with one or two main points, contradicts what every biblical scholar these days knows. Isn't a simple moral application intended by the words, go and do likewise? Surely Jesus, the original speaker, and Luke, the original writer, did not have these hidden meanings in mind. So how did Augustine arrive at an interpretation that to most modern readers appears utterly bizarre? And how could a modern reader interpret the parable with good conscience in a similar way? So I want to speak very quickly here and offer three points or contextual clues that could help. First of all, it should be noted that Augustine did not invent the main contours of his interpretation. Rather, this reading goes back to the earliest surviving Christian comments on this parable. It was Irenaeus in the late second century who likened the Samaritan to the Lord, who had compassion on the man who fell among the thieves, who bound his wounds, granted two denarii uh, coins, which are the father and the son, Irenaeus says. Um, in the third century, Origen gave a similar interpretation, and when he gave this, he attributed it to one of the elders. don't know who that was or what that means, but somebody older than he. Here's origin. The man who was going, and, and listen to the similarities. The man who was going down is Adam. Jerusalem is paradise, and Jericho is the world. The robbers are hostile powers. The priest is the law. The Levite is the prophets, and the Samaritan is Christ. The wounds are disobedience. The beast is the Lord's body. The stable, or inn, which accepts all who wish to enter, is the church. And further, the two denarii mean the father and the son. The manager of the inn is the head of the church to whom its care has been entrusted. And the fact that the Samaritan promises he will return represents the Savior's second coming. All of this, Origen says, has been said reasonable, reasonably and beautifully. So it strikes me the similarities of Origen's interpretation 
to Irenaeus who came before him, and to Augustine, Ambrose, and others who came after him, I think is interesting. So first of all, we can say, whatever we say about this interpretation, it's not Augustinian interpretation. It's the common patristic interpretation. This is the understanding of the early church when it comes to this parable. Now, the fact that Augustine is uh, traditionary or traditional here does not per se mean that it's a correct interpretation. I'm not saying that yet. Um, but it does, I think, mitigate that initial feeling we hear that Augustine is trying to do something novel or do something that is, like I say, far-fetched in his interpretation. If nothing else, it presents a challenge to Farrar's view that I quoted earlier, namely that Augustine's use of allegory had degenerated into an artistic method of displaying ingenuity and in supporting ecclesiasticism. If there is any degeneration in the case here, Augustine is not the one to blame. The degeneration had already happened by the second century. Slight expansion, I think, we can see in Augustine's interpretation, but I see that as quantitative, not qualitative expansion. Augustine is simply repeating what appears to have been the unanimous interpretation of the church. So that's one consideration. Two, although Jesus could have illustrated the command of neighbor love in a number of ways, the parable he presented is clearly a rescue story, a story about salvation. In a day when, and here's one thing I would put on the left side here above all of these things, perhaps, is everyone considered Christ to be the scope of Scripture, the end or the goal of Scripture. All Scripture is read in the light of Christ's uh, incarnation, which includes the whole Christ event, we might say, uh, ministry, death, burial, resurrection. In a day when uh, everyone agreed that the scope of Scripture is Christ, it would not require a great hermeneutical leap to imagine the rescuer in this rescue story as Christ. Once that Christological point is, ma 